I'm Dr. Philip Regal, pastor at College Avenue Baptist Church in McGregor, and we thank you so much for joining us tonight as we study Revelation chapter 17. We'll be looking at verses 7 through 14 and verse 18. And tonight is talking about the explanation of the harlot. So let's start with Revelation 17 and verse 7. But the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. Now, if you're just now joining us, the angel spoke with John about the symbolism of the harlot, which is the one world religion of the Antichrist, and the beast, and the beast represents the Antichrist himself. And so, uh, in response to John's confusion and amazement about these things that the angel told him, the angel is asking him, why are you confused? Uh, John understood the symbolism, okay, but he's, he's not understanding the connection between the harlot and the beast, nor the symbolism of the beast carrying the harlot. So, verse 18 explains to us the connection and the symbolism there. Look at that with me, if you would. <clears throat> We're looking at Revelation 7 and verse 18. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So he's saying there that the woman actually is representing and one with the Antichrist religious system. Not just the uh, theology and the religion, but also the entire system, politically, socially, etc., so that woman is representing the great city, which is Babylon, uh, which is uh, a place where, the, as we talked about last time, the one world religion and the Antichrist originates from, and that's why many believe the Antichrist will be uh, a Muslim from a Syria area. Uh, but of course that's just speculation based on these verses. Uh, look at 18. B, which says, which reigns over the kings of the earth. So saying, this is saying that the Antichrist religious and political system will control all the leaders and all the nations of the earth during the seven-year tribulation. Uh, now go to verse 8. Revelation 17, verse 8. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. So in this chapter, there is a lot of symbolism going on and, and a lot of words and teachings that have already been revealed, but also a lot of encouragement as well. So in verse 8, when it says, the beast that you saw was, that word was is referring to the fake death of the Antichrist. Remember in the beginning when he is a respected leader among all the nations, uh, he fakes his death and fakes the resurrection, and the whole world believes, oh, wow, you know, this has got to be uh, just somebody from God for, for this to happen. And so that's what that scripture means there. And when it says, and is not, that, that's referring to the fake death as well. And then it says, will ascend out of the bottomless pit, referring to the devil from hell, living in and through the Antichrist. And then the next words in verse 8 are really words of encouragement to the church that he won't last very long. Uh, because it says, and go into perdition, referring to the time after the battle of Armageddon when the Antichrist and the devil himself is, and his associate is thrown into hell forever. So uh, look at uh, the last part of verse 8 there. Those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. So 
everybody, all the unbelievers all around the world will, will marvel at his fake death, but they will also marvel and, and be, be shocked, confused, amazed uh, when, he, when he and the devil and his associate are all thrown into hell. They will all see that, but then they realize they're next, you know, uh, at the great white throne judgment. Verse 9. Oh, wait, let's, let's go to the end of verse uh, 8 there, if we can. When they see the beast that was and is not and yet is, is, is we've just gone over what that means from earlier. Uh, verse 9, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So, now, you need to read verse 10 to understand verse 9. So it goes on to say, these are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. So, let's refer back to the beginning of verse 9. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. These seven mountains represent the seven kings of the nations around the world that bow down to and obey everything that the Antichrist says. The word mountains in the Old Testament often represents rule, authority, and power. And these seven world empires uh, control not only their regions, but also uh, they make sure that everything is done perfectly the way the Antichrist says it must be done. And if people don't obey them, and their uh, delegate authority all over the world that, and all over their area that they rule, then, then they will be punished and killed. Uh, of course, that's after the rapture. We don't have to worry about that church, praise the Lord. But uh, many people become Christians after the rapture, and they will be uh, go through a lot of persecution and death, torture. Verse 10. And by the way, that's why it's so important. If you are unsure that you would go to heaven if you died, if you are unsure, even 1% unsure, that you would be raptured when the rapture comes, then you need to receive Jesus right now. That means that you're not sure that you're forgiven forever. And the Bible says that you must be certain that you are a child of God and that your sins have been cleansed and forgiven forever or, or you're not a child of God. You're not born again. See, that's called saving faith. And you're not given that gift. You're not able to even understand the meaning of the cross, the atoning death of Jesus, unless you ask Jesus to open your mind and heart to understand those truths and then receive those truths. So uh, 1 John 5.13, write that down. 1 John 5.13 these things are written, why? So you can know that you have everlasting life. So receive that gift right now. If you have not, just say a simple prayer like, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for all my sins. Forgive me forever. Take control of my life. And you know what? If you say that prayer and you mean it, his spirit comes into your heart and he will never, ever leave you. Isn't that awesome? He promises that, but you've got to mean that prayer. And there will be plenty of evidence when he comes into you that you are born again. You are totally changed. You love him with all your heart, and you maintain a relationship with him every day, and he lives through you to reach other people. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and uh, look at verse 10. Uh, five have fallen. So those are world leaders. Five of the world leaders have fallen, referring to... Uh, the five Gentile empires that had fallen by the time of John's vision. These five empires that had fallen are Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. And then the next part, 10c. One is the one world empire that existed at the time of John's vision was Rome. That's what those two words are referring to. One is, is referring to Rome. 10D, verse 10, and, and the next part of it, the other has not yet come, referring to the Antichrist 
world empire that comes during those last days. And, and that would be uh, during, of course, the seven-year tribulation after the rapture. And then 10E, when he comes, he must continue a short time. So let's look back. That's referring to Revelation 13, 5. Let's go back there. Keep your finger there in 18. It's going to be 17. And we'll go back to Revelation 13, 5, which says, And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. So the Antichrist empire will last only a short time in its full power and, you know, after the Antichrist becomes the one world leader and, and he um, does all of his evil, most evil, crazy things he's ever done. That's the last three and a half years. So, so that empire will continue to grow during the entire seven-year tribulation to where at the halfway point of those three and a half, excuse me, halfway point of those seven years, after the first three and a half years, then it will be greater and more powerful than it's ever been. So that's what that's referring to right there. Uh, the, the, that empire with all of its power all around the world will, will only be for 42 months. And that's also a word of encouragement too uh, to all those who will be left here after the rapture. They'll still have the Bible. They will still have these very words we're studying right now. And, and these will be words of encouragement for them to know that it, it won't be that much longer until Jesus comes and, and wins the victory and uh, takes over the devil and all of his forces. Let's look at verse 11. And the beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. So uh, here in 11... Uh, it says the beast that was and is not and is himself also the eighth. It's referring to the Antichrist being the eighth world leader. Uh, and then 11b says, and is of the seven. And this is something that most people don't know and unless they read these verses, that the Antichrist will be one of those seven leaders in the world before the rapture. So he, he will just be one of uh, of the seven leaders in the world that, that are, are taking over the whole world and, and beginning that one world religion and one world political system that everybody has to go by. So, so all that's going to begin to come together during uh, the time right before the rapture. So that's something that... Uh, Many people don't realize that, that he, will, he will actually rise in power. It's, it's after the rapture that he does his fake death and resurrection and ascends to that place as the one world leader. Um, okay, uh, 11c, verse 11c, and is going to perdition. And of course, another word of encouragement that, you know, he's not going to reign forever. It's, it's a short time. And uh, hell is his final destination. Look at verse 12. And the ten horns which you saw are the ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. Now, this is really strange. And again, these are things that most people don't know. Most Christians don't know, and, and probably a lot of ministers and pastors don't know because they haven't read the Word thoroughly enough to know these things. I didn't know it until I went to seminary and, and read these things and studied these things. But uh, verse 12 is talking about the uh, end of the seven-year tribulation when the Antichrist Empire will be reconstructed and divided into ten administrative regions. So that's what verse 12 is talking about when it says the ten horns are the ten kings. That's referring to the ten administrative regions uh, near the end of that seven-year tribulation. So, so those, the, the government, the one world religious political system will actually begin to be reconstructed, trying to have more and more and more power 
to be able to come against Jesus and the angel armies and all, all of his children, all of his believers from, from all eternity, meaning you and me. We're going to be part of those that were raptured and we're coming back as the army of Christ and, uh, and we're going to help him to take over uh, against the devil. So, so that's the, uh, the ten horns that they're, they're reconstructing, they're, they're uh, dividing their one world government into ten administrative regions. Uh, verse 12b, who have received no kingdoms as yet. In other words, they don't rule as leaders until just the end of the seven-year tribulation, just before the battle of Armageddon. And then uh, 12c, they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. Now, this represents the brevity of their rule. Uh, it's, it's like, okay, we've got to do something and make it even bigger, make it even better, and I've got this great idea. And, and, and you know, the, the Antichrist is saying, the, the Lord, Yahweh, is giving me this, so we're going to win this battle. We're going to keep our, our power over the devil. And he's calling Yahweh, the true God, the devil. And so he's saying, uh, Yahweh gave this to me. We're going to reconstruct our administration of these ten regions, and, and we're going to uh, have this great power. But guess what? The power is only for one hour before the battle of Armageddon where Jesus comes down and crushes them. In, a, in, a, in an instant with his power. Uh, and so, uh, of course, as I, as I mentioned before, the battle of Armageddon is not an ongoing battle. It's a quick annihilation by the Lord, and, and he pulverizes them. And the Bible says the blood rises in that region up to the uh, bridle of a horse is how, how thick the blood is. By, by the deaths of millions of people who have arrived to, to fight against Yahweh, Jesus Christ, and all of his forces. Um, so many believe that one hour to be uh, symbolic of just a, a short time, that's really not just an hour, but, you know, I believe it really is literal. I believe as soon as they reconstruct everything and they go into battle for and, and it's, it's finally done, the reconstruction's done, they, they march there to Megiddo for the Battle of Armageddon, and that's just one hour, and, and they're pulverized. They're done away with. Verse 13, these are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. So they do everything the Antichrist commands without questioning. And it also says in this verse, Revelation 17, 13, that they are 100% unified. There's no arguing. There's no people saying, oh, we're not going to do it their way. There's no one saying, I think I have a better idea. No. Satan has them completely unified. And that's why Jesus says his church must be unified. We must be working together. We must be closely connected to Jesus in relationship, closely connected to each other in relationship, and, and closely connected to the Word of God, the purposes of God, and, and fulfilling everything that God has told us to do together with one mind and one purpose and, and one ministry. And instead of uh, allowing people who are fake Christians... Or, or maybe baby Christians in diapers to try to bring division in the church. You cannot allow that. You cannot allow that because uh, division among Christians causes that church to become weaker and weaker and weaker. Okay, verse 14. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings. Amen. And those who are with him are called chosen, excuse me, those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Amen. So they believe they can defeat Jesus who has come down on his white horse with his sword, with his angel army and all of his believers. But it says here in verse 14, as a great word of encouragement, no way. No way can they defeat 
the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, because it has been predestined before the world created that Jesus would win this battle when he comes back on that white horse. Now, in verse 14b, uh, he calls us, his children, of all the ages, chosen. So these are important words, folks, that we need to study and we need to understand the meaning of them uh, because there's a lot of mistranslation of these words. But if you understand them fully, it's exciting. It's thrilling. And it, it causes you to rejoice and have joy and praise the Lord. So uh, let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us, there's the word, the chosen, see? Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. So, two words there I want to look at, chosen and predestined. The word predestination doesn't mean what the uh, five-point Calvinists say it means, who believe we do not have a choice about salvation, that God chooses who he's going to choose, and we don't need to evangelize, or we don't need to share the gospel because God's going to, going to choose who he wants to choose to be his children. Baloney. They don't know the word of God. Because the word of God says the final command of Jesus was to go out and share the gospel. He says it over and over and over in the word of God. That, why would anyone have a gift of evangelism if we're not to share the gospel? Why would we be commanded? All believers are commanded to share the good news. So, so five-point Calvinists take it to an extreme that we don't have a choice at all. We do. Now, the fact is, God chooses us. But the, th the thing is, predestination means that God knows the future. He knows that we're going to choose Him. He sets everything up. He gets all the glory because, think about it, whoever shared Jesus with you, the Lord set that up before the world was created. And so he knew you would receive him, so he went to that trouble to have all those people plant seeds in you and others come along and water those seeds and someone bring you to salvation and then others mentor you and grow you in the faith. And that's called discipleship and sanctification, which all Christians are supposed to do. And so all of that is predestination. The Lord knows what you're going to choose. So he as I said earlier, he brings to you enlightenment and understanding so that you're able to understand the atoning death of Jesus on the cross. You're able to understand eternal forgiveness. You're able to understand that we confess our sins every day, not so we can go to heaven, but because we love the Lord. We, we serve Jesus every day. We work for him, not so we can work our way to heaven because we're saved by works. No, we're saved by grace, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. By grace we're saved through faith, that none of ourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works. So no man can boast. Every scripture that talks about works is talking about Jesus living through us. And it's natural. It's not something that we have to, oh, I've got to do this, or I may lose my salvation. No, the Bible, says that, the Bible has many, many scriptures that say that we cannot lose our salvation. He will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. That's all the way through the Old Testament and New Testament. So the thing is, when somebody says they're a Christian, they don't live for the Lord, they've never been born again because they don't have the power of God to be able to say no to temptation. So when you are chosen... You're chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ because he knows you're going to let his spirit in to take control. Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And then the word predestination, remember, it just means 
that, that God set everything up for all those people to share with you and grow you because he knew you'd be receptive. He knew you would choose that. See, see, God is the one who does the choosing. God is the one who set all that up. He gets all the glory. But he also called us and we chose to receive him. Uh, that's all through the word of God. Choose you this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So it's important that we uh, remember that, that there's example after example that we can show people in the Word of God that people are uh, having that choice by God uh, to receiving or not. Now the next word is called. We are called. Turn to John 6.44. Okay, uh, John 6, 44 says this. Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up the last day. So, no one will be drawn for salvation by God unless God knows they're ready to submit to him as Lord and believe in the atoning death of Jesus for their eternal forgiveness. So God knows everything. And uh, God, God makes sure that, that he opens your heart and mind to know that he is calling you to change you, to make you his child, to give you the mind of Christ, uh, to help you to be empowered by his spirit to live his life. Now, uh, you know, the people who uh, I mentioned earlier that are fake Christians or those uh, who choose to never grow as Christians, they're baby Christians. The Bible calls them carnal Christians. You know, they're the ones causing trouble and disunity in the church. Um, you know, they're, they're the ones who uh, rebel. And so you've got to pray for them. But if they don't change, uh, there's got to be church discipline. Uh, he also calls us in... Verse 14, faithful. Look at Romans 8, 9. Romans 8, 9. Okay. It says this. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So, Again, if you are not a born-again Christian, you do not have the Spirit of Jesus living in you. You are not able to be able to live the Christian life. You are able to fake it only so long, and then you're found out because it's impossible for you to fake being a Christian. I also want to read to you one of my favorite verses or passages. It is 1 John 2, verses 3 through 6 which says this. Now by this we know that we know him. In other words, Jesus, referring to Jesus. By this we know that we know Jesus if we keep his commands. He who says, I know Jesus and does not keep his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Now look at verse 6. He who says he abides in him ought himself to walk just as Jesus walked. That's only possible by the power of Jesus Christ. Okay, I want to close by reading verse 15 tonight. And he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits, the peoples, the multitudes, nations, and tongues. And so all that saying is, that Babylon on the Euphrates River uh, is the source, the origin point that dominates the whole world uh, during that time of the seven-year tribulation. So um, I want to read to you one last verse in closing, and that's Matthew 24, 30, and 31. Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to be looking at verses 30 and 31, which say this. 
Jesus speaking, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So that's a, that's a great word about the rapture that could come any minute, church. And we need to be excited about that, knowing that we're going to be lifted up and taken out of this crazy world when that happens. If it happens, uh, of course, before, we, before our body expires. But either way, it's a win-win, isn't it? Either way, we're going to be with Jesus before long. This life is very short. Um, again, if you need to talk, if you need to pray, feel free to call me anytime. My cell phone number is 214-826-3294. I will be glad to counsel with you, uh, give you uh, some encouragement, Bible uh, encouragement, and also uh, pray with you. So uh, call me anytime, night or day. If I, don't, if I don't answer my phone, be sure to leave a message. I'll return as soon as possible. Thank you all so much for listening. God bless you.